Greetings, my name is Ravis Henry. I'm a park ranger at Canyon de Chez National Monument, and I also work with Great Sand Dunes National Park. I belong to the Towering House Clan, and I'm born for the Coyote Pass Hamas Clan. I am Navajo, and I originally come from a place called Alamo, New Mexico. That's where I was born and raised, but I currently reside in Canyon de Chez. Today, I'm gonna to share just a little bit with you about some of the stories that come from my people, the tribe of the Navajo, the Dene, as we call ourselves in our language. It is told by our people, the Dene tribe, that we migrated through four different worlds to get into the world that we currently live in. We emerged from a giant reed, and through that reed, we came into this glittering world, as we call it. And as we arrived in this world, it is told that the deities, the holy people, and Dene, they created four sacred mountains for us out of four different stones or shells. The first mountain they created out of white shell and they used a bolt of lightning using an arrow to shoot this white shell to the east. They created the white shell mountain, Yothbeitzi. They created the second mountain out of turquoise. With the stone of turquoise and a stone knife, they created the, the turquoise mountain and placed it to the south. The third mountain was created of abalone shell. With the abalone shell, they used a beam of light to create another mountain, and they placed this mountain in the west. And they called it the Chithitzi, the abalone shell mountain. For the fourth and final time, they used the stone of black jet and they used a rainbow to create this mountain. And they placed this mountain to the north, calling it Pashzinitzi, the Black Jet Mountain. These mountains then began to breathe and they began to speak. They began to be alive just like any other human being and other plants and living organisms. And as these mountains began to speak, they wanted to have their own name, a special name. So the White Shell Mountain was then given the name of Sisna Jin. And then the Turquoise Mountain was given the name of So Zif. And the Abalone Shell Mountain was given the name of Doko Osli. And for the north, the Black Jet Mountain, they gave the name of the Ben Sun. And these four mountains, Sisna Jin, So Zif, Doko Osli, the Ben Sun. These four mountains are the sacred mountains for the Navajo people. They were the first to be created by the deities in this glittering world, and they serve as a foundation to the homeland of the Navajo people. These mountains hold this part of the world in its place so that the land never moves. Together, the mountains create a dome that protects our homeland. And within the boundaries of these four sacred mountains, we have all that we need to sustain our life. As long as we speak to these mountains, we honor these mountains, we make offerings to them, we pray to them, and we sing the song of these mountains. Today, these mountains still remain. Sisna Jinnah to the far east is Mount Blanca. Tzodzil to the south is Mount Taylor. Doko Asli to the west is or are the San Francisco peaks and the Bensa to the north is Mount Hesperus. These mountains today still serve as the boundaries to Navajo land, the traditional homeland of the Dene, of my people. Welcome, my name's Kristen Poole and I'm the artistic director at the Foster. And um, we're here today to talk about Tony's 15th journey, Sacred Places, watercolor diaries in the American Southwest. And Tony, behind you, um, I believe is Mount Hesperus, is that correct? It is, I'm not actually in Mount Hesperus. This is, this is brought to us by magic. <laughs> <laughs> so Tony, I remember a visual of the map of the sort of four, four corners area with all of those sort of red dots and some notes. And when you sat down and, and sort of developed that map, did you do it with a person or a group of people or 
how did that sort of map of sites evolved? And I think there are some places on that map where you didn't end up painting. Mm, mm, I think that's probably right. Um, well, first of all, of course, I did some research. Uh, um, I, I got a lot of books um, about, I mean, there are a lot of books around about sacred places of America. Um, and so it's not difficult to pinpoint them, really. Um, and I, I'd certainly done that. But then I went to uh, stay with some friends in, in, um, in New Mexico who were just um, absolutely brilliant at, at uh, um, knowing uh, everything really about the subject. There's a wonderful photograph somewhere of the three of us surrounded by books and maps and studies and, and notes and all sorts of things. And, and, the, and the kind of excitement generated from just the interaction between those two just talking and, and me kind of joining in was fantastic. And so they were just fabulous. And, and then also um, quite a lot of people connected with Gerald Peters Gallery Quite a few people had very strong connections with the Native American tribes and populations around there. And they too were very specific about places that would be interesting and places that wouldn't. Uh, and so between all these people um, and other people, I, I just garnered all this stuff and ended up with a notebook full of, full of notes and a map with dots on it. And then I simply went to all the dots and had a look. <laughs> so the four sacred mountains, did that idea come to you from your reading or did it come from you to you from these these advisors and experts or do you remember exactly how that came forward because it's really it's a sort of central focus of the exhibition in my mind those paintings are really a an anchor yeah well in fact they were an anchor for me too in a way because it's nice to have a part of the landscape kind of circumscribed otherwise you spread out into all sorts of places <laughs> and of course i did spread out into all sorts of places i mean to have a super i don't live anywhere near the four sacred mountains but it was an anchor to start with because it meant that that they were all worthy of a major painting and as you say once you've done the major painting of those four that really is a strong starting statement really for for how the exhibition is going to, going to look. I mean, you know, you do need some, some things to, to knock your socks off at an early stage sort of thing. So, um, uh, and, and also I just thought it, I thought it was a very strong, um, I mean, they obviously are extraordinarily central to the Dine nation and the way they think about their land. And so that seemed to me to, to give it a very strong start really to do that. So you went in with some, background knowledge about the Dine, the Navajos, legends about these mountains. Is, is that correct? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as to say that. I was always very wary, I think, of trying to interpret uh, other uh, people's um, uh, sort of, the, the, you know, the symbolism that they attach to these places and, and their, their, own, their own law about these places. Um, because I always felt that, that you know, an Anglo coming from England trying to interpret that kind of thing was always going to get into trouble. I thought the sensible thing to do was to approach it as a sort of ignoramus, really, that, 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 that I'm here to respond to these places it, as an artist uh, with an open mind. Uh, you know, I, I realise they're sacred. Uh, I will treat them with, with respect and reverence and... Um, I won't do any harm. I'm here simply to interpret one person, one person's interpretation of someone wandering with an open mind through through your landscapes. Right. Well, it's so interesting because as a as a person who's dedicated decades of their life to making visible the beauty of the wildlands and the beauty of these places, in some ways, your a natural sort of insider, but when you think about religions and religious practice, so many native tribes, the land is the home. The land is the is is the the church, as it were. And um, you know, we've all been to. I don't even know if this is an analogy, but I think about the beautiful churches that we've all been to all over the world. And you walk in and you have this awesome sense of, of beauty and craftsmanship and um, 
the wonder of the light sometimes, but you still can't get in, right? You still mm -hmm. don't have that whole experience that you would if this were your religion, or I have to assume that. So did you, did you feel like an outsider or did you, once you were in and rooted on the land and you spend so much careful time thinking and looking, did you get a sense of, of, of understanding of the sacredness? I, I don't know how to explain that question better, but. No, I, I think, I think um, if, you, if you sit for several days at a time in silence, uh, contemplating you know, some particular mountain or some particular you know, strange rock sticking out of the landscape, you do you do feel that you have imbued something from it yourself you have received something um some sort of insight i suppose uh whether that's religious or not i don't know but um but certainly it's it um you know i could i think i think after i concentrated on these places i could always understand why they were considered to be sacred i simply wanted to 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 re respond to the place itself in my own way but but um but I did, I did, as I say, I, I did feel that that um, I wouldn't say I communicated with it, but I did feel that I'd been enriched by the experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, I again, I you've had such a lifetime of experience of being on the land, and I think you sort of naturally know that the land has the ability to to change a person if you spend time mm. carefully being there. Um, mm. And whatever you wanna call that is, is different, but um, I know you treaded lightly and I know you were careful and thoughtful about that. And I noticed when I was looking at the um, inscriptions and the titles of the four sacred mountains, then in each one, you essentially gave it a, three different names. Can you mm -hmm. talk about mm -hmm. those three different names mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. each of the four mountains had? Yeah, sure. But I mean, the first name was always the Dine name. The second name was the color that the, the Dine associated with that mountain, which I tried to reflect in the in the sort of objects that I placed along the bottom of those paintings. And then the third name was the Anglo name, um, which of course bore no relation to either of those two things, <laughs> those two other names. <laughs> so, you know, I there's been so much conversation, rightly so, right now at this moment about, about the sacred lands that the indigenous tribes all over the world have and how those sacred lands, how do we, per, how do we hold them? How do we as nations and as countries and as people hold them? And so many of them are, are open to the public. Some of them are on public lands since you've had so much time now to be in those lands and to appreciate them and to have a little bit of a deeper sense of those traditions and many of us, do you have any feelings about how those lands should be cared for or protected that, that sort of evolved as a result of these experiences? It's a tough one really that because, um, I mean, morally, I, th I think the, you know, a lot of the Native American lands should be given back to them. Um, I was I was appalled the other day to see to see some sacred uh, cave had been auctioned off for a million and a half dollars or something uh, because it was obviously on private land belonged to somebody and he sold it. And the, and the, and the, I can't remember which tribe it was, but of course they wanted it. It was it was part of their patrimony. I mean, it was it was uh, of great importance to them, but it was sold off to somebody else. They never they never managed to buy it. Um, and, and, and that seemed to me to be a pretty crude um, example as the way people shouldn't be treated. Um, but, but the trouble is, of course, it's, it's mostly too late. Uh, I, mean, I mean, you know, the, the Native Americans have been given their designated lands and that's it. They're not likely to get any more, I don't suppose. Um, and, even, uh, and, and you also get the impression sometimes that they're only allowed to keep them while nobody else wants them um, <laughs> uh, because they were, they were given them in the first place because they were considered to be useless. And, and now, of course, they may not be quite so useless because they've got all sorts of minerals and things in them. Right. And suddenly, and suddenly uh, you know, they're under pressure to give them up again um, or to sell them off or to exploit them. 
uh, and you can't blame them for doing that. I mean, I know people get upset because the the uh, Native Americans build ca casinos and things and and make some, make some money out of it. Um, but on the other hand, they they we can't expect them to go back to how things were in, in you know the 14th century. Um, they're not going to live like that. Why should they? Right. Uh, we, we don't. Um, and so, and so it's, it's a really difficult thing. And of course, it's not quite so bad in the US as it is in many places. I mean, if you think of Brazil and the pressure the tribes are under there, uh, or and most other places, in fact, um, you know, the US isn't quite as bad as most places, but um, how could they be protected? I think ultimately it should be um, the tribes who decide that. Uh, and we just have to trust to their to, to, the, to how sacred they feel these places are. I think they do have a strong sense of that themselves, um, as far as I can tell. Uh, but, I mean, it's not up to us to dictate. In the souvenirs, I think for almost all of these four to sacred mountains, mm -hmm. you include an arrowhead. Yes. And can you tell how you acquired those arrowheads? Because I know that was a sure. thoughtful Yeah, point. they were made for me by by someone called Homer Etherton, who was a DNA um, and an absolute master arrowhead maker. And I asked him if he could make me a set of, a set of arrowheads or some arrowheads for my paintings. And, and he said, well, these will be the last ones I'll ever make, he said, because my wrists have given out. He was about 80, I think he was 84. And, and I said, well, I hope you've taught someone how to do this. Uh, and he said, no, nobody's interested. And, and, and uh, that seems a terrible tragedy, but I just felt enormously privileged to, to have met him and to, and to have got these arrowheads from him because they're, they're, they're wonderful things. And I also, I also, of course, put a cartridge case next to it because of course, in a way, this is, it's to signify the fact that this was a clash of cultures. And so I couldn't help but make that political point really. Yeah, yeah, it's a wonderful collection of, of um, documents in the souvenirs. And I, mm. I so appreciate that there's a contemporary maker of arrowheads. I think we sometimes think about um, Native American culture in this country as something that occurred in the past. Mm. And mm. the reality is that there's very vibrant Native American culture here and present today. Tony, thank you so much. Um, it's been a pleasure, it always is. Um, I learned so much and I'm so grateful for your time. Um, and for your reflections on this time um, in this really special place in the United States. Appreciate well, thank it. Thank you. I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed going back uh, what is it, 12 years to, to remember these things and rereading bits of my diaries and things, uh, all sorts of things I'd forgotten. So that's been useful to me too. It's been quite nice. <laughs>